Praise the Lord. God is good. And his mercy endures forever because he is a God of holiness and righteousness. And we ought to worship him. I'm so glad that when we come together uh, to worship God that we don't have to hold back. That we don't have to wonder uh, what other people are thinking. And so we are so grateful that you're here today. Worship the Lord. And those of you that are at home are home also there in your living room worshiping God with us. Thank you so much. If you have your Bible today, I want you to turn with me to the book of Nehemiah, the second chapter. Uh, uh, we are still talking about restoration. God wants to restore his people, wants to restore uh, his word. He wants to restore to us uh, who we are to be because for the most part the church seems to have kind of uh, gone in other directions that God does not and did not ordain for us to go. You know, uh, in the book of Nehemiah, if you've ever read the whole book of Nehemiah, we find that God uh, opens the door for Nehemiah to come back to uh, Jerusalem and to rebuild the city. This is after uh, or near the end of the Babylonian captivity, you know, where Israel was sent off for 70 years into uh, Babylon uh, under Nebuchadnezzar because of their sin against God and of their disobedience to God's law. Uh, and so it's a very difficult time, we found out in the last couple of weeks as we were reading through this, that uh, for the people of God, as I said, they're coming out of captivity. God opens the door for Nehemiah through the favor of God over the king. And he opens the, the door for him to return and to get the people back on track. Because God does not love like his people living with a defeatist attitude. Can you say amen? I mean, there are a lot of things that can pull us down and bring us down, and sin is probably the worst of it all. But, you know, God didn't create us and design us to live that way. And he wants a people who are passionate about him. He wants a people who love him with all their heart and all their soul and all their mind, that love him more than life itself. I wonder how many we have here today that love God that way. Hallelujah. But that's who God designed us to be. And he doesn't want us to live with a defeatist attitude where like, oh my, you know, things are so bad. Things are, what, are we, what are we gonna do? You know, kind of wringing our hands type of an attitude. No, I mean, there are times that challenge us. Yes, that's true. But God is greater than your challenges. God is greater than your need. God is greater than the devil and his kingdom all put together. Can you say amen? And God desires a people who are passionate about him. And so I want to talk to you this morning about God restoring the warrior spirit in God's people. I said warrior spirit. Oh, come on. Warrior spirit. Yeah, not just kind of, well, whatever will be, will be. You know, que sera, sera. No. God is calling a people to be the salt of the earth, the light of the world, a people who will make a difference where they are, where you live, where you work. God called his people to be passionate for him and passionate for the gospel. And this idea of uh, being a warrior isn't just something that, you know, comes out of the blue. I want to show you in the scripture. So Nehemiah, in Nehemiah chapter 2, Verse 18, he goes back to Jerusalem and he tells the people uh, what God has been doing. He told them, verse 18, of the hand of my God that had been upon me for good, he said, and the words that the king had spoken to me. And they said, that is the people that he was talking to, he said, listen, I want to tell you how God opened the door. I want to tell you uh, what the king has, uh, has allowed me to do. And he began to lay out the work for them. And they said, let's rise up then and build. In other words, let's just not talk about it anymore. Let's get out and do it. So they strengthened their hands for the good work. But, everybody say but. But when Sanballat the Horonite and Tobiah the Ammonite, servant and Geshem the Arab heard of it, they jeered at us and despised us and said, What is this thing you are doing? Are you rebelling against the king? Then I replied to them, The God of heaven will make us prosper, and we his servants will arise and build. But you have no portion or right or claim in Jerusalem. 
And we see that Nehemiah had inspired the people to get up and build. And all of a sudden, the enemies of the people of God rise up. Sanballat, it says, and Tobiah, and Gisham, the Arab. And they jeered at them. They began to make fun of them. And then they even kind of uh, uh, brought a, a, a word kind of to try to... Th- uh, uh, Make them afraid to, 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 you know, hey, the king is the one that you should check with if you're going to do anything here. And they said, uh, you know, does the king know? Are you rebelling against the king? And of course, Nehemiah didn't explain to them because you don't have to explain anything to the devil. You just have to proclaim who God is. Come on. When the devil comes and says, well, who do you think you are? Listen, you don't have to tell them. You just say, you know, our God is mighty and awesome and great. That's who we serve. And so he said to them, listen, the God of heaven will make us prosper. In other words, God is going to give us victory in this. God's the one who's going to, uh, uh, and he's declaring it. I mean, nothing's happened yet, but he's saying it. God, the God of heaven, will make us prosper, and we, his servants, are going to rise up and build. He said, but you don't have anything to say about this. You have no portion at all in this that God is doing. Now, in chapter 4 of Nehemiah, it says that when Sanballat, again, that the enemy, the Horonite, the, the, the one that, you know, leads the, the, um, uh, all the opposition against the people of God. He appears throughout several of the chapters here. But when Sambalad heard that we were building the wall, see, they'd gotten busy. He was angry. Everybody say angry. He was angry and greatly enraged. And again, he said he jeered at the Jews. And he said in the presence of his brothers and of the army of Samaria, what are these feeble Jews doing? Will they restore it for themselves? Will they sacrifice? Will they finish, uh, finish up in one day? In other words, they're making fun of them. Will they revive the stones out of the heaps of rubbish and burned ones at that? In other words, are they going to use all the stones? Look at it. It's all fallen down. It's all burnt. And then he says, and Tobiah the Ammonite was beside him. And he said, yes, what are they building? If a fox goes upon it, he will break down their stone wall. In other words, they're making fun of them. These Jews can't build anything. They're not going to do anything. Look at the rubbish. Look at all these stones. What, are they going to use these burnt stones to build a wall, to rebuild the wall? You know, if, even if they do build it, right? Even if they do build it, a fox will run on top of it and it'll just, it'll just all fall down because they don't know what they're doing. And again, Satan loves to jeer at you. Satan loves to, to come against you. But I want to tell you something today. Our, fl- our fight is not with flesh and blood. Our fight, our spiritual fight is not with people. Another translation says uh, with human flesh, human bodies. We're not fighting people. And so our fight today is against Satan. Our fight today is against the demonic forces of darkness that oftentimes use flesh and blood, use people to oppose the work of God. We see it in our nation today, the opposition to the Word of God. I was reading the other day of a church in California, uh, uh, Pastor MacArthur's church, and they decided that they were going to meet because that's what the Bible tells us, that we're called together. The government is not allowed to tell the church what it can do. You know, they love to keep the church and state separate whenever the the state wants to get in. But whenever the church uses that same argument and says, listen, we are are not under the authority of the state. We're in the authority of God. And God commanded us to meet. God commanded us to worship him. You're telling us that we can't. We can't even sing in church because the state said you can't do it. So he's standing up against him. Well, now the, 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 the state has come back and say, well, you rented this parking lot. Listen, because it's a huge church. They rented this parking lot for over 50 years from the city. That's a long time, folks. That's half a century. And now the city says, because you won't do what we command you to do, we're going to take that lease away from you. So the persecution has started. And praise God that they're still standing and saying, well, even if you do that, we're still going to meet. We're figuring out a way for people to come and people to get here. Because the church of Christ cannot yield itself to the, the flesh and blood demonic forces that Satan uses. He uses people. He uses all kinds of things to oppose the work of God. When Nehemiah encourages the people, look at Nehemiah chapter uh, uh, 4 there in verse 10. And in Judah, it was said, the strength of those who bear the burdens is failing. In other words, the people in Judah were saying, man, they've they've been working and they're they're tired. And he says, there is too much rubble. By ourselves, we will not be able to rebuild the wall. See, there was already some discouragement that was coming in. 
And our enemies said, they will not know or see till we come among them and kill them and stop the work. And at that time, the Jews who lived near them came from all directions and said to us ten times, you must return to us. <clears throat> verse 13, your right hand, O Lord. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, verse 13. <clears throat> So in the lowest part of the space behind the wall, Jeremiah was saying, in the open places, I stationed the people by their clans, the families with their swords and their spears and their bows. It says, and I looked and I arose and said to the nobles and to all the officials and to the rest of the people here, Nehemiah is leading the people again to do the work, to continue in the mission God had called him to do. And so he said to them, do not be afraid of them. Fear is one of the things that stops us the most from doing the will of God. And you know, Nehemiah says here, do not be afraid of them. Everybody say, don't be afraid. Now, did you know that somebody can tell you not to be afraid, but that doesn't stop you from being afraid? Come on. That's not going to stop you from being afraid. Just telling somebody, don't be afraid, doesn't stop the fear. So why does Nehemiah say, don't be afraid of them. Don't be afraid. You know, it's like when somebody's down, people say, hey, don't be, don't worry, be happy. <laughs> well, it, what do you mean, just don't worry? You don't, know, you don't know what I'm going through. So just telling somebody that isn't the answer. And so Nehemiah knows this. So he says, don't be afraid of them. And yet they are afraid. But notice what he says after that. Remember. All right. So defeating fear has to do with what you know. It's knowing something, the knowledge of something. And he says, remember the Lord who is great and awesome. In other words, fear comes. Yes, we all can be afraid. But how you are able to overcome fear, not be afraid when you should be afraid, is because you know something perhaps that somebody else doesn't know. And he says, and he reminds them, remember the Lord. Everybody say, remember the Lord. When you're afraid, remember the Lord. He said, and he is great and awesome. And he says, now instead of being afraid, get up and what? And fight. Fight for your brothers and your sons and your daughters and your wives and your homes. And people sometimes will say, yeah, but you don't understand. It, I'm afraid. Of course you're afraid. But listen, here's how you overcome the fear. Who is the Lord in your life? Remember the Lord. He is great and he is awesome. Remember who God is is. Don't be afraid. of Why? Because we're people of faith. If I say faith. Amen. See, fear can be overcome by the knowledge of who God is. Faith in the truth of who God is. And we must know who the Lord is. And so Nehemiah says, remember the Lord. And also, you have to use what God has given you. Now, if you've been logging on with us on Wednesday night for the past month or month and a half, you know, Pastor Abel's been sharing about the armor of God. We have been given the armor of God. And we're to put it on. Put on the armor of God. You see, you have Christ. But the Bible says, put on Christ. In other words, allow by your faith Christ to dwell and to rule in your life. We have, we have to use what we've been given. Paul says to the church in Corinth in 2 Corinthians, the 10th chapter, and beginning at verse 3. Let's go over there. 2 Corinthians 10 and verse 3. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 3. For though we walk in the flesh, he said, we are not waging war according to the flesh. See, we're living in flesh, bodies. We live in a physical world that God uh, created for us to live in. And even though we walk as physical human beings, he said our flesh, our weapons are not fleshly. They're not carnal. For the weapons of our warfare, if I say warfare, see, we're in a war. The weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. They have divine power to destroy strongholds. We destroy arguments, Paul said, and every lofty opinion and that is raised against the what? The knowledge of God. And we take every thought captive to obey Christ or to the obedience 
of Christ. And so we see here, Paul is saying that we're in a war. We're walking in the flesh. We have bodies made of, uh, of flesh and blood, but we're in a battle that is a spiritual fight that we have been given armor to wear, that we have been given uh, divine, it says here, power to destroy strongholds. You know what a stronghold is? You know, we were in the in, in the uh, in the army, uh, they taught us about strongholds. And an army immediately wants to take possession of areas that are the strongest positions from which to defend or from which to launch attacks. Those strongholds the enemy wants to build in your life and in my life. And he does it through our thoughts. He does it through uh, thoughts of fear. And so Paul says that the weapons of our warfare destroy arguments and opinions that are raised against the knowledge of God. And sometimes a thought will come to you. Maybe it's a thought of fear that tells you, listen, you better listen to this thought because, you know, something bad's going to happen here. That thought contradicts who God is. God is greater than your fear. God is greater than anything that the enemy can bring against you. And so when you identify those thoughts, you have to understand and bring them captive. You will obey Christ. We will obey the Lord. We will trust the Lord. And as you begin to confess God's promises over your life, you begin to use that armor that God has given you. The Bible tells us that the devil cannot, cannot make you flee. He is going to flee. Can you say amen? Now, Nehemiah, then go, go back to Nehemiah chapter 4 and verse 15. And we find again here that Nehemiah uh, is uh, telling us how they went about to uh, do the work that God had called them to do. And Nehemiah chapter 4, verse 15, it says, When our enemies heard that it was known to us that the God had frustrated their plans, and we all returned to the wall, each to his work. Again, Nehemiah had encouraged them. Get up and, and, and stand. Fight for your, for your families. Fight for your sons. Fight for your daughters. Fight for, you know, your uh, wives and husbands. From that day on, he said, half of my servants worked on construction and half held the spears, the shields, the bows, the coats of mail. And the leader stood behind the whole house of Judah. So here are the people that they're being attacked. They're being threatened. And uh, the enemies of God are encircling them. They're talking about it. And so instead of drawing back in fear, they stood up and they said, listen, we're not going to stop building. We're not going to stop in our mission that God has given us to rebuild the cities and rebuild the walls and the things that have fallen down. And here's what we're going to do. And they had a strategy. So some people were holding on to the shears and the, or, or, or the, uh, the, the uh, shields and the swords. And other people were working. And it says from that day on half, uh, excuse me, keep going. Verse 17. He says, those who were in the building, building of the wall, those who carried burdens were loaded in such a way that each labored on the work with one hand. And what they do with the other? They held his weapon. So they were building and they held the weapon. Why? Because they had to be alert. Because the enemies were trying to come and to destroy not only the wall, but destroy them. And so they stood up and they worked. They continued to work. They were vigilant. They served the purpose of God and yet they were spiritual alert, alert. That's what you and I have to be. We're not to draw back in fear when the enemy comes at us because we know who God is. He is great and he is awesome. And so as Christians, we're called, you and I are called to fight a spiritual battle. And we cannot cower down because the enemy comes at us. We cannot cower down and settle because the enemy threatens us. But a Christian can only develop, I believe, a warrior spirit when he knows who he belongs to. And I said to you, I was going to tell you why this uh, is so important about developing a warrior spirit. Look at Exodus chapter 15. And we're going to begin here at verse 1. Exodus chapter 15 and verse 1. Praise God. <clears throat> in Exodus 15, Moses and the sons of Israel sang this song to the Lord. This is when they were uh, going through the wilderness. They crossed the, uh, the Jordan. God uh, had delivered them, excuse me, the Red Sea. He had delivered them from Pharaoh's army. And they began to sing this song. 
when they got to the other side, remember God opened the Red Sea, they went through it on, as on dry land, and then God closed the Red Sea and drowned the army of Pharaoh who was behind them. And so they sang this song, I will sing to the Lord for he is highly exalted. The horse and its rider he has hurled into the sea. And the Lord is my strength and song and he has become my salvation. This is my God, they were singing, and I will praise him, my father's God, and I will extol him. The Lord is a warrior. The Lord is a warrior. And his name is the Lord, it says, or Yahweh is his name. Now here, the song is declaring, the people were declaring, they were singing out loud, the Lord, our God, is a warrior. Keep on, verse 4. Pharaoh's chariots and his army he has cast into the sea, and the choices of his officers are drowned in the Red Sea. The deeps cover them. They went down into the depths like a stone. He says, your right hand, O Lord, is majestic in power. Your right hand, O Lord, shatters who? The enemy. Verse 7, and in your greatness, the greatness of your excellency, you overthrow those who rise up against you. You see, there is no one that can rise up against God. There's no one that can stand up against the knowledge of God. And that's why Paul says we take captive every thought to the obedience of Christ. It says, in the greatness of your excellency, you overthrew those who rise up against you. You sent forth your burning anger, and it consumes them as chaff. And Zephaniah chapter 3, verse 16, there's even a song that's based out of this. Uh, some of you probably remember it. And, and, and Zephaniah says, in that day I will be, it will be said of, uh, to Jerusalem, do not be afraid, O Zion. All right, here's it again. Here's the encouragement not to be afraid. Remember Nehemiah said, don't be afraid. Remember the Lord. And here the prophet Zephaniah says, do not be afraid, O Zion, and do not let your hands fall limp. Why? Because the Lord your God is in your midst, a victorious warrior. You see, it takes knowledge. It takes faith. It takes, you know, uh, uh, knowledge of what God's Word says so that when you are tempted to be afraid, when the enemy comes and it looks like it's the end, you can stand up and declare who God is. The Lord my God in the midst of me is a victorious warrior. Hallelujah. Why does he call us to be also warriors, passionate warriors for his cause? Because he is a warrior himself. Hallelujah. And he doesn't allow anyone or anything to stand in his way and defeat him. And we are his kids. Hallelujah. The Lord is in our midst and he is a victorious warrior. What kind of warrior? A mighty victorious warrior. He will exult over you with joy. This warrior loves you. You're his kid if you're in Christ. And he says, this victorious warrior, he will exult over you with joy. God wants to be joyous when he looks at your life. And he will be quiet, he said. He will be quiet in his love. And he will rejoice over you with shouts of joy. Do you see that? He exults over you. He will rejoice over you with shouts of joy. Because you are his kid, you share his nature. And our God is a victorious warrior. Hallelujah. And we are called to be people who have a warrior spirit in us as well. Nehemiah prayed and he instructed the people to work and to fight for their brothers, to fight for their daughters. You know, God always will uh, uh, call a people to stand for him and for his glory in every generation. And we can read the stories of Nehemiah, we can read the stories of Zephaniah, we can read the stories of these people that in their time they stood for God and in God, and that's great and good. But we're in this generation, and God in every generation, he always calls his people to fight the good fight of faith, to fight the fight of faith. Paul wrote to Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 11 and 12. He said, as you, man of God, he said, pursue, he said, flee these things. So the things he was talking about there are the love of money, the love of possessions. And he said, flee those things and follow after. That's what the word pursue means. Pursue righteousness. What are you following after? What do you live for? You see, as a child of God, as a, as a warrior, as passionate about God's mission, we follow after what's right. 
We follow after what's right and righteous. Somebody was arguing me some uh, uh, months back and was telling me, but, but you're Hispanic and why are you against, against your own people? I said, I was raised, I was, I was born a Hispanic, but my citizenship is in heaven. And he said, but you don't stand up for your people. I said, I was born a Hispanic, but my people are the people of God. Because those are the ones I'm going to spend eternity with. Those are my people. And I stand for righteousness. He said, and I don't care if you're Hispanic. If you're wrong, I won't stand with you. If you're evil, I won't stand with you. I don't care if you're Hispanic. Because my citizenship isn't here. It's in heaven. And as a man of God, I'm to pursue, listen, not earthly things, but heavenly things. And I'm to pursue righteousness. And if you're Chinese and you stand for righteousness, then I'll stand with you. I don't care who you are, what color you are. Because God doesn't look at that. He looks at your heart. And he said, you pursue righteousness. What else? Man of God, pursue godliness. Man of, of God and women of God, pursue faith and faithfulness and love and steadfastness. And gentleness, all the fruits of the Spirit. And then in verse 12, he says this, fight the good fight of faith. You see, how do you fight the fight of faith? Well, you have to be pursuing the right things. If you're going to be a passionate warrior for God with a warrior spirit, you've got to know what that means. It isn't just, you know, some people read fight and, and they're ready. Wait a minute, fight the good fight. All right, not just fight, fight the good fight. The good fight of faith. What does that mean? you got to hold on to something. The fight of faith means I'm going to fight, but I'm holding on to something. What? Righteousness, love, faith, what he just mentioned. But he says, notice here, fight the good fight of faith. Take hold of eternal life. And what that means is, he's saying is take hold of the things that are eternal. Take hold of things that really have life and give life. Because to this is what you were called. This is what you were called to. To fight the good fight of faith. Don't just fight for the sake of fighting. Warriors know when the fight is worth it and the spoils are worth it. You know, sometimes we get into all kinds of fight and we just want to win. And when you win, what do you win? Well, the, the, the spoils weren't worth the fight. But if you're going to fight, you might as well fight for righteousness and fight for, for, for godliness and fight for what Paul says here and lay hold of eternal life. That's what it means. You lay hold of the things that are really worth fighting for and those things are eternal. Can you say praise the Lord? So we need a people who will stand in the midst of the darkness that surrounds us all over the place. God needs a people who will stand in the gap. God needs gap fillers. He needs warriors. And I wonder how many of us will step up and say to God, Lord, make me a warrior. I want to have a warrior spirit. I don't want to just kind of flounder around. I want to have a warrior spirit because you are a mighty warrior. You are a victorious warrior. And you exult over me and you rejoice over me with singing. God sings when he sees his kids standing for the things that he stands for. Hallelujah. And we are so blessed to have a father like that. Now, if you go to uh, Psalm, but go to the Old Testament, Psalm 20 with me. I want to, I, I read this Psalm uh, in our prayer time on Thursday, and the Lord kept uh, dealing with me out of the psalm. And so I began to study a little bit about the psalm and the psalm of David. And it is actually an encouragement to trust in the Lord and in the name of the Lord. But in Psalm 20, we begin here at verse 1. May the Lord answer you in the day of trouble, David writes. May the name of the God of Jacob protect you. May he send you help from the sanctuary. And give you support from Zion. May he remember all your offerings and regard with favor your burnt sacrifices. Now, this is a psalm really uh, of, a, of a dedication. We, we say a dedication time or a dedication service. You see, when the, when the army of Israel went out into battle. When they were facing enemies that, that uh, they had to face in the conquest of the promised land. The law of God required their officers, required their soldiers to first dedicate themselves to the Lord 
And so here David speaks of this dedication service, and he, and he talks about God's help. And he says to them, may he send you help from the sanctuary. Why does he mention that? Well, because the sanctuary was a special place to the people of God. Uh, hold your place there, Deuteronomy 14 and verse 23. Deuteronomy 14, 23, we read this. And before the Lord your God, in the place that he will choose... That place that he chose was the tabernacle or the, t or, the, or, or the dwelling place of God. This was where God said, this is where you will offer up your sacrifice. This is where you will come and offer up your sacrifice and worship me. And the place that he will choose to make his name dwell there. He said, and you shall eat the tithe of your grain and of your wine and of your oil and the firstborn of your herd and the flock, that you may learn to fear the Lord your God always. This is the place that God chose. Notice, to place your, his name there. And so when Paul, or excuse me, when David says here that he will send help from the sanctuary, God's name was associated with that sanctuary. The help came from God's presence. Because God was concerned about his glory. God's always concerned about his glory. That's why he does everything for his glory's sake. The glory of God is at stake when the children of Israel went out to fight. And so God wanted them to consecrate themselves to him before they went out to fight. And in Psalm 20, he continues, verse 4, May he grant you your heart's desire and fulfill all your plans. How many of you have heart's desires? Right? Notice he said, your, may God fulfill your heart's desires. He says, may God grant your heart's desires and fulfill all your plans. Everybody say plans. Because desires and plans go together. Listen, may we shout for joy over your salvation. And in the name of our God, set up our banners. May the Lord fulfill all your petitions. Plans and petitions go together. I have plans. I have desires that I'm, I'm praying about, you know, for God to, to bring the past and to fulfill. He said, but listen, your petitions also have to go along with your plans. They go together. But when you're making plans, you ought to pray about them. Come on. When you're making plans, you ought to pray about them. And he says here, may God fulfill all your petitions. See, and, the, and then he says something interesting here. I want you to notice here in verse 5. He says, and in the name of our God, we will set up our banners. The translation says, we will raise up our banners. The banner was the identifying uh, uh, mark of that particular tribe. Every tribe had their own flag. And they would fly it. They would raise it up. And when the flag was raised up or it was waved during the battle, it was a, ba a sign of victory. And it's interesting to me because as David writes this psalm, right, he is affirming the victory before the battle. In the name of the Lord, we will set up our banners. You see, that banner was a sign of who they were in God. And he's affirming this victory before the battle even begins. Why? Because faith, People who walk by faith, listen, faith is the conviction of the things we don't see yet. And God was sending him out to fight. God was sending him out to, 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 uh, to take over the promised land because God had given it to them. And they had to fight. It wasn't just about praying. Now they had to step out and be those warriors that God required them to be. And so they planted their flag and said, in the name of the Lord. Why? Because that's who they're trusting in. They're not trusting in their power. Yes, they're going to go out and fight, but they're not trusting in their, you know, mighty man. They're trusting in God. And so they set up the flag and he said, and in the name of the Lord, we will set up our banners. And so when you and I are fighting the spiritual fight, we set up our banners. Our faith is our banner. Our faith is the conviction that God will give us victory over whatever it is that we're facing. And warriors, listen, mighty warriors, people with a warrior spirit walk by faith, not by sight. And they declared the victory before it even started. David, in Psalm 27, verse 11, he wrote this. Psalm 27, verse 11 through 4. Teach me your way, O Lord, and lead me on a level path because of my what? 
my enemies. Keep going, please. And give me not up to the will of my adversaries. Lord, don't give me up to the will. Why is he praying that? Well, because all of us can be defeated. In our own power, we can be defeated. And so David said, Lord, don't give me up to the will of my adversaries. They, what they want to do is they want to destroy me. They want to end, you know, end everything that you're trying to build here. False witnesses have arisen against me. They breathe out violence. Go on. I believe, David said, listen, I love this about David, a man of faith. I believe that I shall look upon the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Now, if you weren't very good in English in school like I was, you probably missed the import of this. But if you understand English, listen, if you understand tenses, present tense and future tense, here's what I want you to see. David said, go back please to verse 13. He said, I believe. Now, what tense is that? Present. Right now, I believe. Right? Not, not I believed, that's past tense, but I believe, it's present tense, right now, that I shall look upon, what is that? Future. I shall look upon the goodness of the Lord. It isn't here yet, I don't see it yet. He said, but I believe that I will see it. So my question is, what comes first, believing or seeing? Believing. You see, because faith is the conviction of things that we don't even see. So warriors, listen, a person with a warrior spirit is a person who walks by faith. He trusts God. In the name of the Lord, we set up our banners. But it looks like everything's falling. God said, what are you going to build? Whatever you build is going to fall down. Even if you were to build a wall, if a fox jumps on top of it, remember Nehemiah? They, they told him, it's all going to crumble. And that didn't stop them. Why? Because they had warrior spirits. We're not going to stop. We're going to go on. And even if we have to build with one hand and hold the weapon with the other. And oftentimes we think, well, if we'll just pray, God's going to do it all. And he's not going to, I'm just going to sit here and wait. Well, you're going to be waiting a long time. Because notice, they prayed to God, yes. They set up their banners. But what did they do? They also stepped out. Right? Notice what he says. Wait for the Lord. Be strong. Let your heart take courage. Wait for the Lord. In other words, trust in Him. God is going to act, but you need to also step out and act as a warrior. And they stood out. They stood up and they began to go out into build. And David said, I believe that I shall see the goodness of the Lord. Faith comes first. Now, warriors fight and trust in the only one who can give them victory. I don't care how talented you are, how much education you have. I don't care how many degrees after your name. There are things that you cannot do. And all of us understand that. You know, we, 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 it's just part of who we are. We know that there are things that we cannot do. But so as believers, as warriors, we fight and we trust in the only one who can give us victory. Look at verse 6. Now I know, he says, that the Lord saves his anointed. What does the Lord do? He saves. He will answer him from his holy heaven. God answers prayer. With the saving might of his right hand. He said God has power and might to save. Now some people he says trust in chariots. And some in horses. He said what does that mean? Well at that time the army has had chariots. They didn't have tanks. That was the tank of the day I guess. They had chariots right. That could that with speed they could move. They had uh, he said uh, uh, horses. Right. They had cavalry. I have people that rode on horses, they, could, they, were, they were swift, they were fast. And, and so it gave the, the enemy an advantage. I mean, it gave them an advantage over the enemy because they had the, the power of chariots and horses. And so David said, some trust in chariots and some in horses. But we will remember. There's the word again. Remember. Do not be afraid. Remember. The Lord your God is great and awesome. Yes. And he says, we will remember. Some trusted chariots and some in horses. You remember Pharaoh's army was coming after them with chariots and horses. And what could the, the, the Israelites do? They, they just come out of bondage. They've been in bondage for 400 years. And they have left Egypt and they're on the way to the promised land. And all of a sudden they're before the Red Sea. Oh my God, why did God bring us here? God must be a, a terrible, you know, tactician. 
He brings us here. We can't go to the right or the left. There's mountains and there's a sea here. We're kind of in a box. And here comes Pharaoh. Boy, God really messed up here. He doesn't know too much about warfare. Well, that's what usually carnal people think about God. But I want you to be different. I want you to have that warrior spirit because God is a warrior. There's nobody that can defeat them. There's no wisdom that can rise against him. And so the children of Israel find themselves there. And so Moses begins to pray and begins to fall on the ground. Oh, God, you know. And God says, get up. What are you doing? Get up. What's that in your hand? What did he have in his hand? He had a, he had a stick. And what is that in your hand? Uh, it's a rod. Well, throw it in the water. <laughs> right? I put it at the water. And what happened when he did that? The Red Sea opened up, right? And the priests carrying the Ark of the Covenant, they walked, the Bible said, they, they were the first to step in. And as they stepped in, the water opened up. Because God is not limited to what you think he can do. You trust in chariots and horses. You trust in your power to deliver you. And you will fail every time. And here comes the chariots and the horses against the people of God. And what happens? Well, God closes the Red Sea on them. And they all drown. The horse and the rider, we read that earlier. The horse and the rider, he is, you know, cast into the sea. Because God is greater than your need. God is greater than your problem. As we begin to know who God is, listen, a warrior spirit begins to rise up on the inside. Listen, I don't know how this is all going to turn out, but I know that God has the victory, and I'm going to stand in that victory. Praise the Lord. He says, they collapse and fall, but we rise and we stand upright. Why? Because we do not trust in chariots or horses. We don't trust in our own strength and in our own power. We trust in the one who grants victory, and his name is Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And right now, you know, people all over the place, they're worried, they're scared. Somebody told me, they asked me that day, well, aren't you scared that you might get the virus and die? And someone on Facebook said, well, you're just saying that because you haven't gotten it. Listen, even if I get it and it's my time to go, I don't have any problem with that. Do you? I don't. Because I know God and I know that he has called me and he has ordained my days. My days are not an accident. My days are not going to be as many as I can my, on my own try to keep, you know, keep myself. Yes, I am cautious. Yes, I am careful. Yes, I, I try to eat as well as I can. But listen, all those things do not extend my life. God is the one who extends my life and ordains my days. So I told him, I'm not afraid. I am not afraid. Because listen. If God has ordained your life and your days, you're not going to live one day longer. And there isn't a doctor in the world that can keep you alive. And if God is not finished with you, there's nothing and no one, not even the devil, that can take you out. Because God has ordained your days. I know we have uh, a couple that's up in their years, 80 or so years. The McLeans, they're probably watching. God bless you guys. They got out of the hospital. Both of them contacted COVID. And they're now out of the hospital and they're in a, in a rehab center. I want to just wave at them. God bless you. God isn't, if God isn't through with you, you're going to go on and you're going to fulfill all your days. Because God is the one who delivers and saves. In Deuteronomy chapter 20, go over there. To the Old Testament. That's the fifth book of the Bible. In Deuteronomy 20, God <clears throat> tells us about this law of warfare. <clears throat> in, Le in Deuteronomy chapter 20 and verse 1, this is what the Lord said to the, to the people of Israel, to the men of Israel, the, the army. He said, when you go out to war against your enemies and see horses and chariots, and an army larger than your own, you shall not be afraid of them. There it is again. You shall not be afraid. That, that repeats itself over and over and over all throughout the Bible. And there's a reason why. He said, even if the army is larger than yours, you shall not be afraid of them. For the Lord your God is with you. Did you know that you and God make a majority? You know, there might be... You know, 
A multitude. David said, though an army should encamp against me, I will not fear, for you are with me. And here again, in the law it is repeated, you won't be afraid, God said, when you go out to war and you see the army. He said, because the Lord is with you, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. You know, I released you from the world power of the day. It's what God is letting them, letting them understand. I let you out of Egypt. You were, you were slaves in Egypt for 400 years. And I took you out of Egypt. The strongest military power of the age. So what army could you look at and say, I wonder if God can handle that? <laughs> That's why the Bible says, don't forget any of his benefits. Bless the Lord, O my soul. And forget not all his benefits benefits. I recall whenever I feel down, I always recall all that God has done for me. I go back and I say, God, thank you. Uh, it, this doesn't look like, you know, things aren't working out, but I know, God, that you're greater than this. And I thank you for all that you've already done for me. I thank you for all that you've given me, more than I deserve exceedingly, abundantly. Thank you. And I find that as I begin to thank God, I begin to get happy. And I begin to get happy, and all of a sudden, what I'm looking at does it really matter? Because God has shifted my focus from looking at something like, like he was telling them, don't look at the army even though it's greater than yours. Look at me because I am with you. And then he goes on and he says this. <clears throat> he says, and when you draw near to the battle, in other words, when you get ready to go out to the battle, the priest shall come forward and speak to the people. Who? The priest. The representative of God, he said, would come and he'll speak to the people. This is the, this is the one that's going to give them the pep talk, okay? The pep rally. All right, and here's the priest is going to say, and he shall say to them, Hear, O Israel, today you're drawing near for battle against your enemies. Let not your heart faint. Do not fear or panic or be in dread of them. For the Lord your God is he who goes with you to fight for you against your enemies to give you the victory. Now I love that verse 4. The Lord your God is, goes with you to fight. But notice he didn't stop just there. He didn't just say, okay, well God's going to fight. Well, I'll just sit here and wait. No. He says the Lord is with you to fight, right? And then he says, <clears throat> against your enemies to give you victory. In other words, he's with you to fight. You've got to go out and you've got to fight. And that's why he told them, don't be afraid. You're near the, uh, you're, you're getting ready to go out and fight. Don't let your heart faint. Don't be afraid. Don't panic. And don't be in dread of them. In other words, don't look at them. Keep your eyes on me. And folks, some of you are facing some challenges and maybe situations that you think, man, how, how could this ever change? Don't look at that. Look at God. Look at the warrior God who is the one who gives you and grants you victory. Yes, you've still got to do your part. Yes, you've still got to stand. You've still got to believe. You've still got to stand and fight. But God is the one who brings the victory. They were not to be afraid because if the Lord had delivered them, as he said, from Pharaoh's mighty army, there wasn't any nation in Canaan that they were going to dispossess that could possibly defeat them because he had already shown them that God had defeated the greatest power that lived. But you know, fear can be very paralyzing, as I said to you before. And this is precisely what every believer needs to hear. Do not be afraid when he confronts the enemies of faith. And any time you're confronting a situation that is greater than you can bear, remember that. Do not be afraid. I am with you. And he gives this to all his saints. He gives this word to everybody. I was looking through the scripture no, in Genesis chapter 15. Verse 1, I'm going to go through this real quickly, so just so you can read it. Here's Abraham. After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. And what did God say to him? Fear not, Abram. Why? Remember, it's not just enough to say fear not. Why? You have to have some understanding of knowledge. Why? Because he said, I am your shield. Don't be afraid. I am your shield and your reward shall be very great. And then over in Genesis 46 and verse 3, his son Jacob this is what the Lord said, I am God, the God of your father. Do not be afraid to go down to Egypt, for there I will make you into a great nation. 
Don't be afraid. And then, it, it, then it to Israel in Exodus 14 and verse 13, Moses said to the people, fear not, stand firm and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will work for you today. For the Egyptians whom you see today, shall, you shall never see again. Fear not, stand firm. In other words, don't look at them, don't dread them. Then Isaiah 41 and verse 10, the Lord said to his people, fear not, I am with you. I want you to get that today. Some of you need to hear that. Don't be afraid. I'm with you. Do not be dismayed. Why? I am your God. If you're saved, if you're in Christ today, that's God's promise to you. Don't be afraid. Don't be dismayed. God says, because I am with you. And you need to affirm. You need to affirm in that warrior spirit, God is with me in the midst of this battle. Yes, I have to fight. Yes, I have to stand. But he said he would be with me until the end of the age. God said, I am your God. I will strengthen you. And that's for somebody here today. God is ministering strength to you right now. I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Go receive God's help. Receive God's uh, uh, c uh, conviction in your heart. He is with you and he will not fail you. He will not forsake you. Go back to Deuteronomy chapter 20. <clears throat> continues here. This is the, uh, the law of warfare. And he says to, to the priest, after you have told the people that they are to look to you, uh, look to me and not be afraid of their enemies. In verse 5, then he says, the, the officer shall speak to the people saying, is there any man who has built a new house and has not dedicated it? So right before they're getting ready to go out, right? He's encouraging them, don't be afraid. The Lord's with you. Then the priest is to do this. <clears throat> he's to go before him and says, all right, now before we go out, uh, how many of you have just built a house and you've not dedicated it? And you look through the armies of the ranks and maybe there's a couple who say, yeah, yeah, I'm about to finish mine. Well, he said, you're about to build a house. Not a well, go back to your house lest you die in the battle and another man dedicate it. <clears throat> Is there any man who has planted a vineyard and has not enjoyed his fruit? Anybody here planted a vineyard? Right? You just start. Yeah. Okay. So you all need to go take care of your vineyard. Right? You haven't enjoyed the fruit. Go back to your house, lest you die in the battle, and someone else enjoy your vineyard, right? Verse 7, is there anybody here just uh, got engaged? All right, anybody here just betrothed? He said, has not taken the, the, his wife yet. Let him go back to his house, lest he die in the battle, and another man take her. The officer shall speak, speak further to the people. All right, is there anybody here who's afraid? Faint-hearted. See, when you're going to face the battle as a mighty warrior, you don't want people who don't have faith. Because they're the ones who are going to be trying to talk you out of it. Out of standing with God. and standing for God, right? And so is anybody here afraid? Honest, be honest, you're afraid. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm afraid. Okay, so you, you, you need to go home. <clears throat> I wonder how many of us would have raised our head right about then. Why? Because you're looking at the wrong thing. He said, you need to be on me, God says. And listen, it's, it's an easy thing to, to just cup out and say, well, I'm afraid, so I'm just going to go back. But it is an eye-opening thing and a revelational thing to stand in faith and go with God and watch what God does. Amen. <laughs> you know, it's to, it's to go out and say, let's do this. You know, so, uh, somebody used the, coined the phrase, the mushroom eaters. You know, the mushroom eaters are, right? The mushroom eaters are those people <clears throat> who go out into the unknown. They don't know what it is, but we're going to go anyway. And they're the people who wait for the mushroom eaters to eat the mushrooms to see if they're okay. Once they have, those are the people who are the visionaries. Those are the people who are the ones with the warrior spirit who step up and say, yeah, this looks like a battle. The army looks bigger than ours. But you know what? The Lord is with us. And the Lord will give us the victory. And so all the people that were afraid, they all step back and say, well, let the mushroom eaters go first. <laughs> Let's see how that goes, right? But they didn't experience the victory the way the warriors who fought experienced the victory. I don't know about you, but I don't just want to read about what God has done. I want to experience God's glory and work in my life. And God working through me. 
God is showing his strength and his power and his might through me as his son. And so he says to them, if you're afraid, go back. If you're afraid, if you, it, you know, uh, you say, well, why does, why does he do this? Why, why does God give this, you know, uh, this cop out out of the world? Well, no, it's not a cop out. It's actually here we see God's interest in the people, be, God being interested in the people enjoying the blessings of life and homes and harvest and honeymoons, praise God, that just devoting themselves to the battles of life. Some people always live engaged in battles about everything, and they never get to enjoy what God has given them. Listen, you can serve, and you can work for God with one hand, and you can hold a weapon with the other hand. But you can enjoy serving your service to God, even though we're all in the middle of a warfare and a might, in the warfare. So there wasn't any Israelite that could use the military excuse Right? Or re military responsibility as an excuse to neglect either their fields or their wives or their fiancés. You see, military service was important to the Lord. But God was more concerned that men had right priorities in their life. And for a man who had just married a woman and go out to war, that's why the Bible says when a man who was in the military married... He had to take a whole year off. That was the law. He could not, even if he wanted to, he could not. The law said that he would stay home for a year. Why? Because he was going to cheer up his wife. I don't know what that means, cheer her up. I, <laughs> I guess he said, you know, I'd rather be over there, but I'm, I'd be here with you. I'm going to cheer you. No, he was to spend time with his wife. Why? Because God is interested, listen, in the priorities of life being in order. God doesn't want you for the sake, listen, of, of some supposed spiritual work and, and service to lose the balance of your life. God doesn't want you to put the priorities and heal priorities to, to the side. Warfare was important, but there were other things also that were important to God. And that was that the people would not lose the, the balance, the responsibilities that they had to their families to their vineyards, and to their fiancé. Now, Jesus mentioned a little bit about this balance in Matthew, the 15th chapter. Let's look at this in verse 4. And Jesus said this to the religious leaders of his day. He says, God commanded, honor your father and your mother. That's the law of God. Honor your father and your mother. One of the commandments. And whoever reviles his father or mother must surely die, God says. But you say, you, the religious man, he says, you say, if anyone tells you if anyone tells his father or his mother, listen, what you would have gained from me is given to God. In other words, a father and mother's in need. And a son says, yeah, well, I got this, but you know what? I've already offered it, and it's, it's going to be an offering to the Lord. I wish I could help you, mom, dad, but you know what? I, I, I'm going I'm to offer it to the Lord. He said, and he need not honor his father. And he says, so for your sake of your tradition, you have made void the word of God. What is he saying? He said, here's, a, here's the Pharisees. They're very religious. And they're telling the people, listen, I know your mom and father need help. But, you know, hey, first is God, right? And yes, God is first. But here what they were using, their religious tradition, right, to keep people from doing what God had initially called them to do first of all. What is that? Honor your father and your mother. That's the, before you do any religious service, honor your father and your mother. He said, I have this money here, but I could help you with this, but you know it's dedicated to God. And so he said, and so you tell the people, you teach them to do that. And in doing that, he said, you teach them not to obey God's command. There was a balance there. Yes, it is important to offer to God sacrifices and offerings. He said, but without neglecting your other priorities, which is to honor your father and your mother. Jesus wants you to be spiritual. And Jesus wants you to be holy. He just doesn't want you to be religious. And the Pharisees were very religious. But they disobeyed God at every turn. There wasn't that balance of life. Now in Deuteronomy 20, he continues this. And we're going to go through this real quickly because my time is gone. Deuteronomy 20 verse 10. When you draw near a city to fight against it, offer terms of peace to it. In other words, you're going to conquer. But the first thing you want to do is you extend a, a terms of peace. And if it responds to you peaceably, it opens to you. All the people who are found in it 
shall do forced labor for you and shall serve you. But if it makes no peace with you, it makes war against you. Listen, this is the law of warfare for the for Israel nation. He said, if you make no peace with you, it makes war against you, then you shall besiege it. And when the Lord your God gives it into your hands, follow me, you shall put all its males to the sword. But the woman and the little ones and the livestock and everything else in the city and all its spoils, you shall take a splendor for yourselves and you shall enjoy the spoil of your enemies, which the Lord your God has given you. Thus you shall do to all the cities that are very far from you. These are the cities that were going to be far away from where they were going to settle in the land of Canaan. He says, which are not cities of the nations here, but in the cities of these people that the Lord your God is giving you for an inheritance. You shall save alive nothing that breathes, but you shall devote them to complete destruction. The Hittites, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Parasites, the Hivites, the Jebusites, as the Lord your God has commanded, that they may not teach you to do according to all their abominable practice that they have done for their gods, and so you sin against the Lord your God. Now, sometimes people read things like this in the Bible, they say, Man, I don't understand that. Why would the Lord send the nation against these nations to drive them out? You know, he's going to give them the land. I understand that. You know, God is the owner of everything. He wants to give them that land. But there's other people there and he's going to drive them out. The only way to drive them out is one, to conquer them or to destroy them with, with, with warfare. <clears throat> and so God says, listen, the first thing you will do there is you'll offer peace. You know, God is a God who offers peace to sinners and to fallen men. But oftentimes men reject that, right? And so God says, if you offer them peace and they will not accept it, they will reject it. That when you conquer them, you will put to death every one of their males. They all die. Now see, today as Christians, we read that and we think, why, why would God do that? Isn't he a God of love? Of course he is. But he's also a God of justice. And we ought never to forget that. And then he says, and here's even something even worse. He said, now, if you go to the cities that are close to where you're going to settle, those cities, you will kill everything that breathes. That means not just the soldiers, but their families and their children and their animals. Everything they were to destroy. And then he says, all you'll do is you'll take whatever's left. And oftentimes people read that in the Bible and they think, well, well, what is that talking about? By the way, folks, that's history. Those are historical facts. Those things actually happened. The people of Israel did go into the land and they did do warfare and they did take over nations. They conquered them. And they did in many instances do what God told them to do. And so how do you reconcile that with a God of love and, and a God of, of the New Testament? You see, there are some scholars there who say, well, the God of the Old Testament isn't really the Father that Jesus talks about in the New Testament. Listen, yes, he is. Except the God that Jesus presented in the New Testament is a God of grace, a great grace and compassion because he came to save sinners. But the God of the Old Testament is the same God. Except when we see the God of the Old Testament, we see a God, listen, of perfect justice and holiness. What is God doing when he sends Israel against these nations to destroy them off the land and for them to conquer the land? What is God doing to those nations? The Hivites, the Jebusites, the, the Ammonites, all of these nations. What is God doing? Because notice what he says. And you will destroy all that they have so that they do not, so that you will not do according to their abominable practices which they have done for their gods and you sin against the Lord. Against me. What is God doing when he sends Israel against these nations? He is bringing judgment to those nations. And question. If God is a God of the whole earth. And he is the righteous judge. Does he have a, a right to judge every nation when he chooses? Of course he does. If he is the righteous judge of the whole earth. He cannot but eventually judge every nation including ours. And so God made a choice to judge those nations for their abominable practices, for their sin. And he used Israel as the rod of his judgment. That is the same God that Jesus spoke about in the New Testament when he said, Do not fear those who are able to kill the body, 
but not the soul. I tell you who to fear, he said, fear him who after he has destroyed the body also will destroy the soul in hell and has the authority to cast you into hell fire. Somehow we miss those verses, right? We, we kind of don't like to hear too much about that. But that's what Jesus said. Paul went later on to write an epistle to the Thessalonians church and he said this about Jesus. He said, Jesus is coming back in flaming fire, taking vengeance upon them who know not God. Do you believe the Bible? That's what the Bible says. And I know we don't, we don't usually hear about that, but you need to know and you need to know your whole God. He is a God of great compassion and mercy. Yes, he is. But he is also a God of holiness and righteousness, whom the Bible says he has appointed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness. And every person will stand before him to give an account of his life. And only those who have trusted Christ, who are under the blood, will be able to overcome that judgment. Are you under the blood? Have you been saved by Jesus Christ, by believing and trusting in him? See, those are the men and women that God is, is bringing out into the world with that warrior spirit. I want you to go out and I, don't, I want you to talk to people and I want you to tell them that I have come to redeem them and save them from their sins. What is he doing? I want you to go out and in that spiritual warfare as you talk, I want you to offer them peace. Jesus wants you to come and have peace with God through the Lord Jesus Christ. Is that what the gospel is about? Absolutely. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ because he'll justify you by faith. And when you're justified by faith, you have peace with God. Offer their peace. When they reject it, remember we read there in Deuteronomy, when you offer them conditions of peace and they reject it, then what comes? Judgment. And oftentimes we don't hear that. We don't tell people, you know. We just say, okay, well, if you don't want to accept the Lord, I guess that's fine. No, we need to warn them. Listen, the only thing that can save you from the coming judgment, God is right now offering you Christ. He is offering you salvation. Paul says, we plead with you in the name of Christ. Be reconciled to God. And we come with peace. We come and offer a Jesus who is merciful and compassionate. Lest they have to face the Jesus who will come with vengeance against those who do not know God. And so it is important for us to let them know. If you reject God's mercy and compassion, the only thing that awaits you is the judgment of God. And I don't want that for you. Nobody wants that for you. But it will come. And that is part of sharing the gospel. Don't just tell people, you know, God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life. Really. Well, God loves you, yes. But the wonderful plan for your life might be that you might have to end up standing as a warrior for him in the midst of persecution. Maybe even give your life for him. That doesn't sound like a wonderful life to me, right? <laughs> no, listen. God is offering you salvation. He's offering you peace. Will you take it? Will you repent of your sin? Because one day God will judge everyone. And I am so glad that I am under the blood. Aren't you? If you're here today, raise your hands to the Lord right now and just thank you. Father, thank you for the blood of Jesus. Thank you, Lord, that you have made peace through the blood of the cross. For everyone, Lord, that believes eternal life. But for those, Lord, who reject it, your word says only wrath. They can expect only judgment. Oh, Father, I pray right now for those that are hearing me, the sound of my voice. May they, Lord, bow their knee in their heart to you right now and say, Jesus, forgive me. Save me. Come into my heart. Give me a new life, Lord. I'm a sinner. I've sinned against you. Come and change me. Fill me with your spirit and make me this warrior for you, God, and for your cause and for your mission. In the name of Jesus, I repent of my sin and I turn to you with all of my heart. Save me, Lord. Save me, Lord. 
Lord, forgive all my iniquity and my sin. Fill me with your spirit. Tell him right there where you are. If you're already saved, tell him, thank you, Lord, for the blood. Oh, thank you, Lord, the blood that never loses its power to save. You're able to save to the uttermost. And I thank you, Lord, that I am saved to the uttermost. And I thank you, Father God, that I am here as a child, as a son, as a soldier in your army. God, make me passionate for the cause of Christ in the name of Jesus. Let me warn those, Lord, who are in peril of going into eternity without Christ in the name of Jesus. And we give you the glory and praise, Father, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. The church of Jesus Christ is called to be a witness to the world. Every one of us, we're called to be a witness wherever we are. And you know, we uh, are and have some teachers here. We have some administrators here in our church. And what we want to do today is we want to pray for those who are going back to school, uh, the students, the teachers, and the educators. And so I'm going to ask you this morning, if you're one of those, if you're going back to school or maybe you've already started, maybe you're online or maybe you're going back to live classroom. I want you to stand. We want to pray for you. If you're a teacher, if you're an educator, I know we have some teachers here. We have some uh, 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 administrators as well. And uh, we want to pray for you. Listen, I want to, I want to share a, a scripture with you from uh, the book of Ephesians as I pray today for our educators. Paul said to the Ephesian church, he said, uh, after talking about the armor of God, he said, and pray for me that utterance may be given to me in the opening of my mouth to make known with boldness the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador. I have been sent by Christ as an ambassador, he said, to make known the mystery of the gospel. He says that I, in proclaiming it, may speak boldly as I ought to speak. It oftentimes we're told, well, in school, you know, you really can't talk about the Lord. Uh, there isn't anything that keeps you from talking about the Lord wherever you are. Because it really isn't against the law to speak. And you, many of you know that already. But what I want to pray for you is that God would help you see how important your place is in the public school system. Because our public school system has become, for the most part, an indoctrination. But I want you to understand how important your part is in letting the truth of God be transmitted to your students and to the teachers that are there. I'm going to pray that God will help you in your utterance that you may open your mouth with boldness to announce the mystery of the gospel for which you are an ambassador. God called you to teach and he placed you in that place to make you an ambassador of the truth. Those children that you ministered to, their little minds are being formed. They need the truth of God. They need to know that there is a God in heaven who loves them and cares for them. So I want to pray for you right now. Heavenly Father, as Paul prayed here, Lord, that utterance would be given to him at the opening of his mouth to make known with boldness the mystery of the gospel. I pray, Father, for each of these teachers and administrators in a system, Lord, that often fights for the truth to be revealed which often fights against, Lord, the instruction of righteousness and morality and ethics. And I pray, Father, for them. I pray that you will give them wisdom to know how in the midst of that system to be ambassadors for the, for the mystery of the gospel. That they may speak boldly, that you would give them, Lord, wisdom to know when and how to speak to their teacher friends who don't know you. To those students, many of them who come with burdens from their home. Maybe of abuse. 
Many of them, Father, depressed, perhaps because of the condition of sin in their homes and families. Father, may you give these teachers compassion to speak the truth, God, to those who have need. I pray, Father, for our educational system. Pray for Betsy DeRoss, the director, Father God, a national director of education. I pray that you would give her wisdom in knowing how, Lord, to reform the educational system so that it more closely reflects the teaching of truth. Father, I pray that you will surround her, God, with men and women who are also men and women of faith and wise. And I pray, Father, for the educational system, the administrators, and those, God, who are tasked with leading the education of our children. Father, I pray in the name of Jesus that reform will come to the educational system, that you will strengthen, God, the teaching of truth in the name of Jesus, and that, Lord, these teachers can shine as lights and these administrators in the midst of a world that is in darkness, that they may, Lord, be bold as ambassadors for the truth, I pray. In the mighty name of Jesus. And we give you praise and glory, Father. Amen. Amen.